channel. I'm happy to have you here today. If you're new, welcome. Today's video is gonna be really, really difficult to get through. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about this case and already know a lot of the details around it because it has gotten the most coverage I've seen a case get in a really long time. Thousands of you have requested that I talk about this case. Things are changing by the hour at this point, and I'm sure by the time that this video goes up, there will be new developments, which I will have a pinned comment with latest updates. I am recording this on Tuesday, September 21st at 4.30 p.m. Mountain Time, and in the last couple hours, we actually found out that Gabby's death was ruled a homicide. I thought I was going to have to use the term suspicious death, but now we can say it. Gabby Petito was murdered. It's so hard to cover cases when they're so fresh like this because so much information is constantly coming out. And at this point, there are so many questions that we just don't have answers to. However, the FBI really needs help at this point when I'm recording, locating Brian Laundry, I'm gonna put a photo of him on the screen. I'm sure many of you have seen his face. He, as of right now when I'm recording, is missing. As of right now, Brian is considered a person of interest in the case. He's not yet been named a suspect, and they're also not yet referring to this as a manhunt. They are referring to Brian as a missing person right now. If you have any information about Brian, if you've seen him, if you have any information about Gabby, even something that you might feel is insignificant, please get that information to the FBI at 1-800-CALL-FBI. Who knows what's gonna happen in the next day? You know, my videos take a little bit of time to edit so I can't get them up as soon as I record them. So like I said, if there are new updates, I will have that pinned comment and I will also be updating on my podcast, Mile Higher, which will be linked below. Because this case has gone so viral, there is a lot of misinformation, rumors, and just general confusion out there. So I'm hoping to clarify as much of that as I can. There are some things that I'm just totally confused about. I'm sure in the upcoming weeks, we will get some more answers. I also wanna say that I send my deepest condolences to the Petito family. I can't imagine what the last couple of weeks have been like for them and how they're feeling. This case is just incredibly heartbreaking, um, especially the body cam footage of Gabby, which we will be going over. I slept like three hours last night. I have been just so consumed by this case and every twist and turn, every update, it's just, it's so much, but I wanna help in any way I can to get the right information out there, to help raise awareness, and to also raise funds for Gabby's family or in her honor. I will leave two donation links below, the only two verified places to donate, according to her family. If this video is monetized, which I'm not sure if it will be because sometimes with highly viral sensitive topics, YouTube will put kind of an auto lockdown on them, but if it is monetized, I will be donating the ad revenue to one of the two places that Gabby's family have asked for donations to go to. And I wanted to say that in the beginning because there have been a lot of fake campaigns going on, fake fundraising schemes. So please be aware that the only two places to donate are the official GoFundMe, which I will have linked below, and the John McNamara Foundation. There's gonna be a lot to go over here, so let's just go ahead and jump in. So first of all, let's talk about Gabby, who she was, Gabrielle Petito. She was born on March 19th, 1999 in Blue Point, Long Island, New York. Gabby was very close with her parents, also her step parents and her younger siblings. Family was everything to her. Her father, Joseph Petito, and her stepmother, Tara, have two kids together, and her mom, Nicole, and her stepdad, Jim Schmidt, have at least one child together, Gabby's brother, TJ, who was just a few years younger than her. Gabby's friends and family says that growing up, she was always a sweet and caring girl. She was very talented, beautiful. She wanted so much out of life. Gabby always had an adventurous spirit to her and a creative side. And that's how she ended up making van life content. Gabby had a real appreciation for nature. She wanted to see as much of the world as she could. When Gabby was in high school, she met a guy named Brian Laundrie and the two of them didn't date back then. They just kind of hung out around the same people and knew of each other. But from the beginning, they had a lot in common because 
Like Gabby, Brian also was very adventurous and really loved being outside. Both Gabby and Brian graduated from Bayport Blue Point High School in 2017. And right out of high school, Gabby had that adventurous spirit. She wanted to travel as much as she could and kind of work odd jobs here and there to get her through, but most of her time was spent being outside, hiking, being creative, reading. Here's a clip of Gabby back in 2019. I love all the events that they do down here in the summer, um, like live after five. Okay, ready, set, go. Happy birthday, Noel. Perfect. Gabby and Brian didn't officially start dating until March of 2019. They went on a sushi date on the beach and really hit it off. Gabby was very interested in Brian. He was an environmentalist. He was a minimalist. He's also a barefoot hiker. In one of his Instagram picture captions, he talks about uh, sustainable packaging and how he prefers to just eat melons because you know the rinds are biodegradable and it's safe for the environment. And he took several photos of him with the melon. He's clearly very proud of it. And right away, when the two of them started dating, they started traveling. They actually went on a huge cross country road trip in a Nissan Sentra in 2019, all the way from the East Coast to California and Oregon. And they camped along the way, visited different cities, beaches, mountains, national parks. They have tons of gorgeous photos. After that trip, they continued to take shorter trips, doing a lot of weekend adventures whenever they could get away. But they they decided that their next road trip things would be done differently. They decided that they wanted to get into van life. I'm sure a lot of you have seen people who are living in vans on social media. It's totally fascinating. I've watched so much van life content. It's a really cool way to live. I don't know if I could personally do it, but I think it's very interesting to watch. And so these channels do get a lot of views and Gabby and Brian started trying to make a name for themselves in this space. In 2020, they started working on this white 2012 Ford Transit van. That was the goal for their future and how they wanted to live. They actually called their YouTube channel Nomadic Static. Gabby did a lot of the posting though on her Instagram account. Both of them were on Instagram and it was a great way for her to, you know, connect with other people, document, her memories and also keep friends and family updated along the way as they traveled. So it looks like her first post with Brian is in March of 2020, just a few days before her 21st birthday. And the post said, one whole year's worth of adventures and stories and a lifetime to go. Then just a few months later, July 2nd, 2020, Gabby posted a picture from their first date with an announcement that Brian had asked her to marry him and she said yes. And in the post, she said, every day is such a dream with you. After the two of them got engaged, their families celebrated, they were really looking forward to their future. Brian's parents are named Christopher and Roberta Laundry, and they are getting a lot of heat right now, which we will talk more about later. But according to them, they were thrilled about the engagement and really loved Gabby. In fact, they liked Gabby so much that they allowed for Gabby and Brian to move in together in their house in Northport, Florida. Gabby was really enjoying exploring this area. You know, it had close proximity to beaches, tons of hiking trails and nature preserves. So it was definitely keeping them entertained, keeping them busy, but they still wanted to live that on the road life for a bit. So they started prepping. They started getting the van ready to take this next big cross country trip. Obviously things were pretty crazy in 2020, so I'm sure that delayed things a little bit and they ended up deciding to go in 2021. Gabby was working a job as a nutritionist at the time and she just quit that got ready and they took off. And the two of them were really excited to fully embrace this sustainable van life and travel more of the country. Gabby wanted to turn their adventures into a blog, you know, continue to grow her social media, which she had grown quite a bit before she went missing. And her dream was to someday do this full time and be a full time traveler. So in March of 2021, the two of them celebrated Gabby's 22nd birthday. And they did that in Georgia by hiking the Appalachian Trail. And then the following month, Gabby's father and her stepmom decided they wanted to be closer to Gabby. So they moved from New York to Vero Beach, Florida, which was only a couple hours from Gabby and Brian. Obviously, 
obviously Gabby was really happy about this. She was very close with her father and she was excited that when she got back from this road trip that she would have, you know, multiple friends and family around now to help her plan her wedding and kind of get them started on their new life together. So they took off on this road trip in June of 2021. They started off in New York on June 17th for her brother's high school graduation, but their real road trip started on July 2nd. They were planning for this to be a four month trip and they were going to travel to a bunch of national parks all over Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, and then a final stop at a friend's place in Portland around Halloween time. And of course, with Brian being a serious minimalist, they used every last inch of Gabby's van to utilize as space so they could travel as long as possible. And Gabby promised her parents that she would keep in touch as much as she could. Obviously, when you are on a road trip, you're gonna be in places where you have no service, so it's kinda of hard to stay in touch, but she was gonna try her best to keep everyone as updated as possible, and she was also doing that via social media for friends and extended family so they could keep up with her travels. And by this time, Gabby had around 100,000 followers on Instagram, so it wasn't just friends and family that were watching. Gabby even set up their website at nomadicstatic.com, and she had plans to work on the site while on the road and start building this new business. So Gabby's first post on Instagram from the trip was on July 4th, and the location was tagged as Monument Rocks Natural Landmark in Gov City, Kansas. And Brian also posted a picture of himself in the same location on July 4th on his account. Then on July 8th, Gabby posted another picture and tagged it in Colorado Springs. Then on July 10th and 11th, Gabby posted pictures from Southern Colorado's Great Sand Dunes National Park and Preserve. And Brian also posted a picture of himself to his account on the 10th. And on the July 11th post, Gabby wrote in the caption that this was their last day in Colorado and they would be heading to Utah next. On July 16th and 18th, she posted photos from Utah's Zion National Park and included pictures of their campsite as well. Brian also posted from Zion on July 16th, 17th, and 18th. On the 21st and 22nd, Gabby was posting from Utah's Bryce Canyon National Park. And in the caption of the second post, she said that it had rained every night that they had spent in the national parks. Brian also posted photos from Bryce Canyon National Park on July 23rd and July 24th. On July 26th, Gabby shared a bunch of photos from Mystic Hot Springs in Monroe, Utah, which I had never even heard of before. It looks absolutely stunning. And I am so happy that Gabby got to see some of these gorgeous places, that she got to see more of this beautiful planet before she was taken from it. In so many of these photos, she looks so happy. And it's hard to say, you know, on social media, how happy she really was. So then on July 29th, Brian posted from Canyonlands National Park in southeastern Utah, and Gabby posted from this location on July 30th and 31st. After her post on July 31st, Gabby didn't post again for 12 days, and we don't know why that is. Of course, something could have been going on, but it's also possible with them traveling through such remote locations that they just had spotty service, I'm not sure. But she went back online on August 12th and started posting pictures from Arches National Park in Grand County, Utah. In her caption, she talked about how they had hiked to Delicate Arch early that morning, and they didn't see as many people as they expected because it's normally a really popular trail. Then on August 19th, a vlog was posted to their nomadic static YouTube channel, and this was actually the first video on the channel. However, the channel seems to be created back in 2013 by Gabby. Sunny today. Brian's stretching, doing some morning yoga. We are right outside Capitol Reef right now in a uh, free dispersed camp spot. And we've been lucky so far at all the places we've stayed, but I'd say this is one of the best so far. 
Since we left New York, I've only set up my hammock once. The same day that that was posted, there was also posts on Gabby's Instagram account with pictures of the inside and outside of their converted van. And the caption on this post actually tags Brian's account and talks about a man in the park who didn't throw away his quote, processed pre-packaged plastic conglomerate of lunch garbage. But what's weird about this post is Gabby didn't specify what park they were at and there was no geo tag on it. And before that, she had tagged the location of every photo. Of course, I don't know if there is any significance to that. She may just have forgot to tag it. It's just too early to say. A few days later, Gabby's father actually placed an Uber Eats order for them, and this was on August 21st. And apparently they had a Wi-Fi outage and they weren't able to order. He had sent them the Uber Eats order while they were in Salt Lake City. On August 21st, they were still in Salt Lake City. They were staying in a hotel near the airport, according to the hotel staff. That day, Gabby had a FaceTime call with her mom, which she had been doing about three times a week. And during the call, Gabby said they were leaving Utah now and gonna be driving to the Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. And after that, they would be heading to Yellowstone National Park. Gabby's last Instagram post was the next day, August 20th. 25th. It was a beautiful series of photos of Gabby smiling in front of a monarch butterfly mural, holding a small crocheted pumpkin, and the caption said, Happy Halloween. The last photo in the series of pictures that she posted, it looked like Gabby was holding up her phone. It didn't seem to really go with the rest of the photos. I mean, maybe she just chose to post it, kind of like a more candid reel photo, but also like her post on August 19th, there was no location tag. The next day, Gabby's mom gets a text from her and she was under the impression that they had made it to Grand Teton National Park. They texted again on August 27th from the Tetons. And then she got her final text from Gabby on August 30th that said, no service in Yosemite. Nicole and Gabby's stepdad, Jim, started to get worried right away. They thought this was unlike Gabby and she just stopped posting on Instagram after this as well. Over the next week, Gabby's page was not updated once, not even a story, and none of her friends had heard from her. So Nicole ends up contacting Gabby's father and her stepmother who are living down in Florida now and lets them know that she hasn't heard from Brian and Gabby. She hoped that maybe Brian's parents had heard from them or had any information. So she started trying to contact them, but got no response, no text calls nothing back from them. She frantically continued to try to get in touch with Gabby, calling her over and over again, calling Brian over and over again, texting them, and could not get a reply. On Friday, September 10th, Nicole talked to the police and told them that she was worried about her daughter. And in recent interviews, she said that she felt like the police didn't take her concerns seriously enough at the time. The next night, September 11th at 6.55 p.m., her mom goes ahead and files a missing persons report. And then she found out this whole time while she has been frantically trying to figure out where Gabby is, Brian has apparently, possibly, been home the whole time that she had been desperately trying to contact him and his parents and was just ignored. It turns out he arrived back in Florida on September 1st with Gabby's van, but did not have Gabby with him. Now this is where it starts to get really confusing. We're just not sure where exactly Brian has been over the last 30 days. But at this point, they do believe that he was in his parents' house for a full 10 days before Gabby was reported missing and never said anything to her family and just completely ignored them. The primary investigators on this case are the Northport Police Department in Florida. The Suffolk County Police are also assisting them. But since Gabby could have gone missing in multiple states, the FBI got involved very quickly. On September 11th, Northport police tried to interview Brian, but his parents wouldn't let them. However, they were able to recover Gabby's van from the laundry's property. As of right now, it's been taken into custody and is being processed for evidence. When the police were finally able to talk to Brian, he invoked his Fifth Amendment right not to say anything that might incriminate him. Then at that point, Brian and his family got a lawyer and refused to say anything to anyone. They have refused to cooperate with the investigation at all. They have refused to speak with Gabby's family to help them in any way. And they are conveniently directing all questions to their attorney, who is also 
very questionable. Their attorney released a statement on the family's behalf that basically said law enforcement tends to blame intimate partners in these kinds of cases. And he advised that his clients not talk to investigators because any statement he made would be used against him. But meanwhile, Gabby's parents are becoming more and more desperate for answers. Joe, if I can just start with you, any news, anything from the authorities, anything that might advance this case? No, uh, I mean, nothing that I have, you know, so uh, to be honest, uh, I, I get the information almost as, as you guys get it. So we've been looking for Gabby for how long and they've known that um, Brian's been there since the first. So if that's that family's version of love to just ignore and not care that someone's gone and people are looking for them and the entire country is looking for them. I mean, that explains how we got to where we are today. They knew that at the very least, Brian knew where he last saw Gabby. He could help in some way. And if he loved her and was going to be, you know, spending the rest of his life with her, why would he not want to help? They also wanted an explanation for why he returned to Florida with Gabby's van, but without her. And through his lawyer, Brian released a statement saying that he planned to remain in the background on all of this. The only member of the Laundry family who has been willing to talk is his sister, Cassie. And Gabby's parents said that she willingly did an interview with the police. She also briefly did an interview with the media. Obviously, me and my family want Gabby to be found safe. She's like a sister and my children love her. And all I want is for her to come home safe and sound and this to be just a big misunderstanding. Eventually, Gabby's parents released a statement, really an open letter, to the Laundry family begging them to help, trying to, you know, have them put themselves in their shoes and imagine as a parent, you know, what this would be like and how could you not want to help? I mean, Gabby lived with you. You said you cared about her. Gabby's family just seems to be totally shocked at how the Laundries have acted. Christopher and Rebecca Laundry, we are writing this letter to ask you to help find our daughter. We understand you are going through a difficult time and your instinct is strong to protect your son. We ask you to put yourselves in our shoes. We haven't been able to sleep or eat and our lives are falling apart. We believe you know the location of where Brian left Gabby. We beg you to tell us. As a parent, how could you let us go through this pain and not help us? So the police have kept a close eye on Brian's house and so has the public. There are tons of people out there protesting. People are very, very upset and understandably. Where is Gabby? At this point, Gabby was considered a missing person. So police were doing everything they could to get her name and face out there as much as possible. So then on September 15th, the police ended up releasing some very upsetting body cam footage of Gabby and Brian. So this footage was actually recorded back on August 12th. And the whole thing started outside of the Moonflower Co-op in Moab, Utah. According to witnesses, Gabby and Brian were apparently arguing outside and someone saw Brian grab Gabby's face and push her. That person identified only as Christopher at this point called the police and reported a possible domestic violence incident and disorderly conduct. That call has just been released, so I will go ahead and insert it here. Hi, uh, I'm calling, I'm right on the corner of Main Street by Moonflower and we're driving by and I'd like to report a domestic dispute. Uh, we drove by and the gentleman was slapping the girl. He was slapping her? Yes, and then we stopped. They ran up and down the sidewalk. He proceeded to hit her in the car and they drove off. All right, I will let somebody know, thank you. So before police arrived, Brian and Gabby had already gotten back in the van and had driven away from the co-op. And then a responding officer actually spotted their van because they were driving 45 miles an hour and the speed limit in this area was 15. The vehicle also crossed a yellow line to switch lanes and swerved up onto the curb. So the officer pulls them over and when he does, he finds Brian in the driver's seat and Gabby crying in the passenger seat. Of course, he asks Gabby why she was crying and here's what she said. What's going on? How come you're crying? I'm just crying. We've just been fighting this morning. Some personal issues. 
was a long day. We, we were camping yesterday and camping got the out supplies and stuff. As you could hear, Gabby said that they were having some personal issues and that they had been fighting all morning. And then Brian starts explaining why they accidentally hit the curb. And then Gabby takes responsibility and said it was her fault because she was distracting him from driving. I'm sorry, I'm sorry I hit the, the bump there. <laughs> I was distracting him from driving, I'm sorry. At this point, the officer asks Gabby to get out of the car. Can I get you to step out of the vehicle for me, ma'am? Yeah. Just hang tight right there. And later in his report, the officer wrote that during the entire conversation, Gabby never stopped crying. She was breathing heavily the entire time and continued to wipe away tears from her face, wipe her nose. This footage is just so upsetting. You can just see how distressed she is, how upset she is, how overwhelmed she is. So the officer separated her from Brian to ask her what was going on, you know, without him there. And that's when she started explaining that she has OCD and she had been kind of picking fights with Brian that morning. Yeah, I don't know. It's just, some days I, <laughs> I have really bad OCD. And okay. I just, I was just cleaning and straightening up the back of the van before and I was apologizing to him and saying, I'm sorry that I'm so mean because sometimes I have OCD and sometimes I just get really frustrated. Not like mean towards him. I just like, I guess, my vibe is like, I really, I hear me like in a bad mood. And I was just saying, I'm sorry if I'm in a bad mood. I've just been really stressed. I had so much work I was doing on my computer this morning. She said they had just been fighting all day because she was in a bad mood. She completely took the blame. At one point she talks about how she had been extra stressed out lately because she was trying to start her blog, make a career out of the whole van life thing and Brian had been extremely discouraging of her and didn't think she could do it. Cool. I just um, quit my job to travel across the country and I'm trying to start a blog. I okay. just have a blog and stuff. So I've been building my website. So I've just been really stressed and he doesn't really believe that I could do any of it. So that's kind of been like a, I don't know, he's like in, down there. I don't know, we've just been fighting all morning and <laughs> And he wouldn't let me in the car before. And then Why I, wouldn't he let you in the car? Because you have your OCD? He told me I needed to calm down. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm perfectly calm. I'm calm all the time. And he really stresses me out. And I just, and this is a rough morning. So the officer then asks Gabby to sit in the back of his car and relax. He assured her she wasn't in trouble, but just looking at her in these clips, is so heart-wrenching. You can just see the pain on her face, the fear. So then the officer goes over to talk to Brian. Another officer had arrived as well and was already talking to him and they asked him to step out of the van eventually as well. Then it was Brian's turn to explain what was going on. This gets worked up sometimes and I try and really distance myself from her. So like I, I lock the car and I walk away from her. What, what happened this morning is that she's trying to start up like her own little website blog and everything. So I give her time. And I, we really had a nice morning if and if anything, but um, she just you know, worked up because we were trying to get going and get our day going. Then the officer asked Brian about his injuries. He had scratches on his hands, his arms, his neck, and his face. You, you want to tell me about those scratches on your face? She had a cell phone in her hand. That's why I was pushing her away. Because I, she, she wanted the, I locked the keys so I could walk away. I, I said, let's just take a breather and let's not you know, go anywhere. Let's just calm down for a minute because she's going to work up. And then she had her phone and was trying to get the keys and she sort of away. I was just trying to, I know I shouldn't push her, but I was just trying to push her away to go, let's, let's just take a minute, step back and breathe. And you see, she got me with her phone. Can I see your hand? Oh, you got a mark right here. Oh, that's from a wire. That's from a wire? Yeah. So the officers basically pieced together that the two of them had a big public fight outside of the co-op that morning. Brian had locked the van and told Gabby to take a walk to calm down. As we understand it right now, she was worried that he was gonna leave her there stranded. So she may have hit him maybe with her cell phone or scratched him. He said that's when he pushed her away. Now we don't know if this is for sure what happened. This is just what the police seem to get. And who knows what actually happened that morning or during this whole trip. Another officer went and talked to Gabby and again, she took the blame. She said that she hit Brian, that she instigated the fight, that she made it all worse. But then she described how Brian had grabbed her face outside of the co-op, which obviously he did 
that and probably more to her when you think about that witness call. Did he, did he hit you though? I mean, I mean, it's okay if you're saying you hit him, but I understand if he hit you, but we want to know the truth if he actually hit you. Where did he hit you? Don't worry, just be honest. Brian had also told the police that the reason he hit the curb was because Gabby saw the police car and freaked out and grabbed the wheel. However, Gabby denied that. Eventually more officers came to the scene and Brian continued to tell them about their argument at the co-op. He said that they had been there from nine to three and had had like little disagreements all day. And he talked a lot. It actually seemed like he couldn't really stop talking. He was smiling, talking politely, and he was going on and on about how he wasn't upset with Gabby. He also mentioned that he didn't have a phone and he didn't want her to take off with her phone because then he would be left phoneless. I don't have my phone, I don't really, I don't have a phone. So she goes off without me, but car, uh, I'm on my own. <laughs> so uh, I was saying, let's just go for a walk and she was trying to get the keys for me. So I was just going, hey, just wait back up, back up and it doesn't she hit me. And I, I didn't, didn't get, I don't want to push you, but I didn't get, I didn't get overtly physical. I was just trying to keep her away. But I'm very confused about this because in the body cam footage, he had a phone on him and he pulled it out. So was this his phone or did he hang on to Gabby's phone? He also said that when Gabby was hitting him and scratching him, that eventually he got really loud and admitted to pushing her. And then I got really loud and like that's probably your everyone's attention where I was going, you know, back up, get away, just give me a phone. Okay, okay, so, so you I, said you pushed her to create some distance, obviously, yeah. right? What happened after that? What got, what got the scratches on your eye? The phone. The phone? Mm -hmm. So you pushed her and she hit you? She was, I wasn't, I, I, it wasn't like a push and she jumped on me, she was, she was already, she was already, I don't want to, she was already swinging and I was pushing. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of angles, a lot of nails, a lot of rings. Yeah. You got yeah. three scratches in your neck, you got one on your left side of your neck, you got one in your face here, and you got four for the bleeding over there. So just trying to so flip up two hands. But Brian insisted he was fine. He wasn't complaining about anything. It seemed like he just wanted to get back on the road. Also in this body cam footage, we can hear both Gabby and Brian saying that they suffer from severe anxiety. Brian seemed to hold his composure the whole time. Like I said, he talked quite a bit. He was polite, he was cooperative, and he didn't wanna press any charges against Gabby. And according to the police, the couple reported that they are in love, engaged to be married, and desperately didn't wish to see anyone charged with a crime. So the officers discussed the situation kind of among themselves, and the second officer on the scene explained why he believed Gabby was the primary aggressor, and that Brian was just trying to get distance from her when he put his hands on her. And warning, it's pretty frustrating to hear this. I saw him hit her, I saw him shove her, but I couldn't tell if it was an aggression against her or a defense against her, as far as her, you know, being the aggressor. So okay. at this point, from what, unless the guy's screaming that he needs to go to jail and did something to this girl, it sounds to me like she is the primary aggressor. Yeah. Now the problem with her being the primary aggressor is in an instance of domestic assault, be it a male or be it a female, we shall arrest. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they have to go to jail. We can do a citation if it meets one of three criterion, which one of them is that we can ensure that they're not going to further risk each other's safety. But the problem with that is they live in the same vehicle. That's what I was going to say. The and other part of it is... There was actually I'm, I'm an getting... injury, too, to the victim, which is him. Right, and I'm getting conflicting stories about why they hit the curb up here. The officer also said that he believed that the reason Brian lied about Gabby grabbing the wheel, and that's why they hit the curb, he believed that the real reason that they hit the curb was because Gabby hit him, and Brian was just protecting her. Oh, what, what did he say why he hit the curb? Well, I've watched, this is what I saw first. I saw him cross the double yellow. I was doing 42 miles an hour. I was, I don't know, probably two car lengths behind him tapping my whales at him, trying to get his attention. They knew I was behind him. And then after he crossed the double yellow, he merged over into the right lane, and then out of nowhere, just boom. Did he tell you why? 
He said that she grabbed the wheel and turned it real hard. She said that she was hitting him in the arm. So sounds legit. I mean, I'm she, sure if I'm driving and my arms on the wheel and I'm getting hit in the arm, I'm probably pulling out the wheel. Yeah. And I'm sure it was a little of both. I mean, usually the truth is somewhere between. He's probably trying not to say that he hit her because he probably doesn't want her charged with assault, yeah. domestic assault. He probably would rather say she pulled the wheel than hit, hit him. Officers agreed that Brian was the victim, and that they had to treat this like any other domestic violence incident, which meant that they would charge Gabby. They knew that Brian didn't want to press charges on her, but they talked to him again, repeating that Gabby was the primary aggressor and that they had to treat this the exact same way as if he had hit her. So the only option that they gave him was for the two of them to separate for the night. Then he would need to go to the police station the next day to waive the no contact order, which was now already in place. And they said Gabby would still need to attend an online court date about the incident. Eventually, they decided that Brian would go stay in a hotel and that Gabby would keep the van. But Brian didn't have money for a hotel. So they decided that they would let him stay at a hotel for free as a victim of domestic violence. But if he was going to go forward with that, he would need to take pictures of his injuries to document them. So once they got everything squared away with Brian, they went back and talked to Gabby again, and she was referred to as the primary aggressor multiple times. Now this has been highly criticized because many people and experts who have watched that body cam footage say there are so many red flags i looked at it with an fbi agent friend of mine and i was terrified when i first saw it when it didn't come out that the pe the wonderful people who made the call said that he was slapping her and so the the two deputy sheriffs say that he was the victim um and she we looked at it this fbi friend of mine and i looked at it and i said this girl's terrorized this is classic domestic abuse he's terrorized her not to tell the cops that he was the aggressor he was the slapper and the puncher but anyway when they first went to go talk to her she was on the phone with her parents and she ended up hanging up with them to talk to the police. They asked her if she was attempting to cause Brian any physical pain when she hit him, emphasizing that this was a very, very important question and that she should think very hard before answering. Very, very important question. How you answer this question is going to determine what happens next. But the only person who can answer this question is you. <laughs> think very hard before you answer the question. Do not quickly answer it. Think very hard. When you slapped him those times, were you attempting to cause him physical pain or physical impairment? Was that what you were attempting to do to him? No. What were, no. You, what were you attempting to do? What was the reason behind the slapping and stuff? I was trying to get him to stop telling him Well, it doesn't sound to me like she attempted to injure him. It's your call. This is 100% your goal. I support you either way. I'll let you get back to your parents, okay? <laughs> so after the group of officers discussed things a little bit more, the officer who had originally pulled them over went and talked to Gabby and told her that he would not cite her for domestic violence and that, you know, Brian wouldn't be pressing charges and the only thing they'd have to do is separate for the night. The footage is so hard to watch. Gabby's just crying as she's nodding, understanding this. The officer noted that Gabby showed signs of separation anxiety. He also said that she was in a confused and emotional state. And he said that he personally did not think that this was a case of domestic assault. Instead, he characterized it as a mental health crisis. Before the officers left, they passed a message from Gabby to Brian. She wanted him to know that she loved him. And she also said to make sure that Brian had his phone charger. But wait, that's confusing because Brian told the officers he didn't have a phone. And remember how I mentioned earlier how he pulled out a phone right in front of the officers after saying he didn't have one? This is still a big point of confusion. So an officer walks Gabby back to their van she was still sniffling at the time and clearly was very shook up. Also in the body cam footage, there's just one female officer on scene, National Park Service Ranger, Melissa Hulls. When Melissa arrived, she focused on Gabby and was hoping that she would be comfortable talking to another woman maybe. And while she was talking to Gabby, she encouraged her to rethink her relationship with Brian, asking her if she was really happy with him. 
She could tell that Gabby was anxious to be away from Brian, and she thought that maybe once they returned to Florida, things would change. After Melissa heard the news that Gabby's body was found, she couldn't help but think maybe there was something more that she could have said to her that day or something she could have done. So Brian's last Instagram post was, August 13th, the day after this incident. He posted a series of two pictures and Gabby wasn't in either of them. The first photo is tagged in Arches National Park and the caption talks about biodegradable packaging versus plastic water bottles. The second photo that he posted was from Moab and the caption was this long rant about the relation of human beings to the planet and all of their living things. Part of the caption says, this tree doesn't require an Apple watch. It doesn't stream its favorite shows or have a microwave oven, pay health insurance, or drink grande iced caramel macchiatos. It's just a tree, but you rarely see these geese riding jet skis or wearing designer clothing either. I think if we all want breathable air and drinkable water, we need to learn how to live with less. And the only posts from Gabby's account that were posted after their incident was on August 19th and August 25th. And like I said earlier, oddly, neither of those posts included a tagged location. Also the outside view from the van in the August 19th post doesn't look like the same terrain as those from the Arches National Park, which was her last tag location. It seems like the pictures in this last post were from a different time. Her hair is shorter, she's not dressed for hiking at all or mountain climbing, and that's how she's dressed in most of her other posts from the trip. People online have also noticed that the comments on her Instagram account were later set to limited and that some of her posts have been edited. Now, according to her mother, Nicole, Gabby and Brian at this point were no longer engaged. According to her, they had decided that they were too young to get married and had just gone back to being boyfriend and girlfriend. But this contradicts what they told officers back on August 12th, they said they were engaged. On September 14th, Gabby's stepdad went out from New York to Wyoming to see her last known location and help search the Grand Teton National Park. So if Gabby was separated from Brian and was told to take the van and he went to a hotel. How did Brian end up with Gabby's van and without her all the way back in Florida? On the morning of September 15th, the police went ahead and announced that Brian was a person of interest in the case. Now this is very different from a suspect. In order to consider someone a suspect, there has to be evidence. And as of right now, they are still referring to him as a person of interest. I'm not sure if that will change by the time that this video goes up. And during the whole search for Gabby, Brian did absolutely nothing to help. His parents did nothing to help. Law enforcement searched for Gabby for days. And at this point they had no idea where she could be. And the search for Gabby was very difficult, you know, without any help from their family. And also because it was taking place across multiple states. I mean, they were looking in Florida, they're looking in Wyoming, they're looking in Utah. It was really after the body cam footage was released that it exploded on the internet and mainly on TikTok, which has been like most things on the internet, a blessing and a curse. There are so many people out there that I have seen who want to help, who want to raise awareness for Gabby for the right reasons, who really care. And then there's a lot of people that seem to be making a joke out of it, acting like this is some trend. I've seen so much misinformation posted. I've seen people claiming to speak with her spirit. It's truly a double-edged sword because I've also seen a lot of wonderful, helpful, beautiful posts done about Gabby and people who have truly shared valuable information. But with this urge to be the first one to report on the case and get the latest information out there before anyone else does so that your TikTok will go viral, it's a big problem. It ends up creating so much misinformation, so much confusion, so much speculation that makes it all harder for the FBI and for her family. Positivity is hard. I'm trying to focus on, on the scenario I have in my head that she's stuck somewhere and she's just, you know, uh, just needs help. You know, and we, you know, we got to just go get her and, and bring her home. I, I know how these things sometimes end, you know, and I'm just trying not to think of that. Uh, the, the media has been awesome. It's, it's actually been a, a good distraction because it's been keeping me so busy. You know, if I had to sit home and 
just twiddle my thumbs and wait, I, I don't think I could do that. So it's actually helped me. Earlier this week, a body was reported, a false report of a body in the Carlton Reserve. They had spent time looking for it. It wasn't even there, it was completely made up. The amount of fake online activity, uh, you know, completely fabricated accounts, account activity and social media traction that is out there uh, is staggering. The volume is staggering. I'm looking at the comments as they're scrolling in here across our platforms and I, I've seen so many, JB, did you see this Instagram user post this or this Reddit or TikTok yeah. user post that? Some account of his went live. There's that, yeah, that right, rumor right, right. out there. There was, a, there was um, uh, an account that went live for I think less than two seconds and it was an Instagram live and uh, people immediately began to think that, that that but you have to remember folks that there's a lot of fake accounts that are being circulated online so much intentionally uh, intentional misdirections that are out there but of course at the same time I realized that people sharing about the case is important a lot of vital tips have actually come from the internet I think it's amazing when people with the right heart come together and truly want to see justice brought to a situation or to see someone missing actually come home. But police have had to take a lot of time trying to dispel some of these rumors that have gone viral on TikTok, on Reddit, on Twitter. And sadly, even some media outlets have reported straight up rumors as if it were true. There were false reports that the police had access to both Gabby and Brian's cell phones. They do not, but there have been a lot of things, a lot of speculative information out there, you know, that was a rumor, but eventually was confirmed to be true by the police or family. So at this point, it's just really hard to say what is real and what is not. And that's why I'm not gonna be spending time in this video going over all the different theories, all the different speculations. I know there's so many out there right now and some of them could be true. I mean, some of them are being investigated fully. There's been a lot of talk about Brian's choice of reading material. There's a clip of him from the Nomadic Static YouTube channel where Brian is reading this book called Annihilation, which is by Jeff Vandermeer. I guess this book is part of a series about people who explore abandoned territories where mysterious things have happened to other explorers, like people who have gone missing. So obviously people have been curious about that, speculating about that, but I'm not sure if it really has anything to do with the situation. Also, also, there was a lot of talk and speculation about Gabby's disappearance having a connection with a horrible double homicide of a newlywed couple, Kylan Schultz and Crystal Turner, who had just gotten married and were traveling in Grand County, Utah. The two of them were last seen on August 13th and were found dead at their campsite on August 18th in the South Mesa area near Moab. There was thoughts that this could be connected because Brian was close by. In fact, one of them actually worked at the co-op that Brian and Gabby were fighting out front of. However, I wanted to clarify for anyone wondering about that, that police have said that there is no connection. So then last week, Friday night, September 17th, things took a huge turn. Brian's parents contacted the FBI and it seemed like they were finally gonna talk. Maybe they would get some answers about Gabby. But when investigators went to the laundry home, Brian was not there. That's when his parents said that Brian left on Tuesday. This is Friday night. Brian being a person of interest, not a suspect and not being charged with any crime. If Brian booked a, a plane ticket for Cancun, could he legally leave the country and go to Cancun and, and go and travel internationally? And the answer is yes, because he's a free man, because and he, he's a person of interest. But at the time, because he's, you know, he's, a, he's not being charged with any crime and he has his passport, He's able to to leave and go where he wants. He's a free he's a free person. He's not being charged with the crime. Here we are now. Brian's location now is is unknown. They say he casually went off to the Carlton Reserve to go hiking. So this reserve is in Venice, Florida. It's about 13 miles away from Brian's home, and it's huge. If you are curious and want to see how large of an area it is, you can just go to your Maps app on your phone, type in Carlton Reserve, and go to satellite view, and you can just see how big it is. So someone could clearly hide in it. Brian's parents said that he just left on Tuesday, and they hadn't heard from him since. I have no idea why they didn't tell the police. I'm sure we all know why, but they didn't give a reason. And according to media reports, Brian's parents were mostly concerned with Brian and about him being missing and didn't even 
say much about Gabby at all. But this was probably all planned because their attorneys were on the phone with them the whole time to make sure they didn't say anything wrong. So later that night, Northport police and the FBI announced to the world that Brian was missing and that there was a search underway for him. We begin this morning with a local story gripping the nation, a new twist in the disappearance of Sarasota County's Gabby Petito. Her fiance, Brian Laundrie, the man with whom she was last seen on a cross country trip three weeks ago, is now missing himself. Police named Laundrie a person of interest in Gabby's disappearance earlier this week. Now he's gone and his family and their attorney say they don't know where he is either. They released an official description of Brian. He's 5'8". He weighs about 160 pounds. He has brown eyes, short brown hair, and trimmed facial hair. He was last seen wearing a hiking bag with a wrist strap. So obviously people have been incredibly frustrated. How could Brian have left? The house has been watched like 24 seven, not only by media, but also just people. There've been tons of police activity. How did he manage to just slip away? People are also frustrated with the police because I personally heard in an interview on Wednesday, an officer saying that they knew where Brian was. And then the next day, they announced that he had been missing since Tuesday. I don't know if they had just believed Brian's parents and they were misled by them. I, I don't understand this part. The police have posted their own statement saying that they are disappointed with how the investigation has gone so far. At this point, Gabby was missing and now Brian was also missing, but they made it clear that this was not a criminal investigation. Then early Saturday morning, September 18th, 50 officers from the Northport Police Department and the FBI went to the Carlton Reserve to start their search. And this was a huge undertaking. It's incredibly lush, it's dense, it's hard to see. There's still questions of whether or not they can even use infrared technology to find him because it's so thick. It's a 24,565 acre reserve. It has more than 80 miles of hiking trails. Tracking dogs have been a big part of the process. They've used articles of Brian's clothing to try to pick up his scent. They've used drones to search overhead. But as of right now, when I'm recording, unless they just haven't reported it, they haven't found anything. Basically take this wood field. You're gonna see the, the, the trail once you get there. So this is gonna intertwine. Also, we have to keep in mind that Brian is a skilled outdoorsman. He's a hiker. He was living this like nomadic lifestyle. Could he survive on his own out there for days? But then at the same time, it seems unlikely because it's so hot down there. It's one of the hottest times of the year right now. It's muggy, it's buggy, it's awful. And he'd probably have to be carrying gallons of water on him unless he has one of those like purification straws. So there's been a lot of question about whether he's even in the reserve or ever even was. Was it a way to deter police? We don't know at this point. Terrain's very difficult. Um, essentially 75% of it's underwater um, and other areas uh, that are dry we're trying to clear. As officers combed the woods in Sarasota County, we learned they weren't alone. Up in Okaloosa County, deputies searched the area where this photo was taken. It came from Sam Bass, who lives in Baker, Florida. He believes the man he caught on his deer camera bears a striking resemblance to Brian Laundry. After following up on that tip, the Okaloosa Sheriff's Office tells us it, quote, did not find anyone or anything of note. Brian Laundry has no known links to this area. Like I said, I'm recording this on the 21st and I've been watching coverage and it looks like they have been searching all day still, but there has not been any new reports of anything found. This is also a really dangerous search because there's a ton of alligators in the Carlton Reserve. I mean, tons of alligators in Florida in general. So it could definitely be a dangerous situation. So eventually the FBI announced that they were narrowing their search down for Gabby to the Grand Teton National Park. They had help from the National Park Service, Teton County Sheriff's Office, and Jackson, Wyoming Police. They were conducting ground surveys at the Spread Creek Dispersed Camping Area, which is the area that they believe Brian and Gabby had been from August 27th 
to August 30th. And authorities have requested help from the public. They are still wanting help. If you know anything, if you happen to be in this area, this Spread Creek dispersed camping ground, please contact the FBI. The number will be on the screen and in the description box. And then there was this woman on TikTok. Her name is Miranda Baker, and she posted about how her and her boyfriend had picked up Brian while he was hitchhiking. She said that she has reported this information to authorities. Of course, I can't verify it and it hasn't been verified, but I want to include it because it's been a hugely viral part of this case and it could be helpful. So let me just go ahead and insert some of her TikToks right now. Hi, my name is Miranda Baker and on August 29th, my boyfriend and I picked up Brian at Grand Teton National Park at 5.30 at night at Coulter Bay. He approached us asking us for a ride because he needed to go to Jackson, which we were going to Jackson that night. So I said, you know, hop in. Um, he hopped in the back of my Jeep. He then told us he's been camping for multiple days without his fiance. He did say he had a fiance and that she was working on their social media page back at their van. In conversation, I brought up, yep, like, we're going to Jackson. Um, he freaked out. He's like, nope, I need to get out right now. Um, you know, like, pull over. So we pulled over at the Jackson Dam. Um, when he asked to ride, he has to go to Jackson, which, if you're familiar with the area, a lot of people call Jackson Hole Jackson. So that's why I said yes to giving him a ride. But you think any good hiker would know south and north. We were going south of the park when... He said he was camping north. He had told us that him and Gabby were not camping on a regulated campsite through the national park, that they were camping basically out in the middle of nowhere along Snake River. This is key information. He said that he had hiked for days along Snake River, but when like looking at his backpack, it wasn't full. And he said all he had was a tarp to sleep on, which you think if you're going camping for days on end, you'd want food and a tent, and he had none of that. And like I said, he looked clean and didn't smell bad. So this is a view of the whole de um, journey with Brian. So that's the top at the park at Coulter Bay. And then we drove him to this dam right here. Then at the dam, we dropped him off at this little turno, and he said he was going to walk across the street to the parking lot, which was full of people, to continue hitchhiking. So this is really strange. Why did he not want to go to Jackson Hole? Why was he confused between Jackson and Jackson Hole? And why did he act so sketchy about getting out? She said the main reason that she posted this wasn't to, you know, get any clout from the situation or get attention. She just feels that someone else may have picked him up after he got out of their car since he was hitchhiking. Then there was another hugely helpful discovery made by a YouTube channel. I believe they're just vloggers. On August 27th, they were driving through Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming, just taking footage with their GoPro. And along this dirt road in the Spread Creek dispersed camping area, they passed a white van. And they noticed the van because it had Florida plates, which was where they were from. And then weeks later, September 19th, last Last week they're going through their GoPro footage because of this case and they know they were in the area and they noticed that there was a van that looked very similar to Gabby's van. They found the footage at around 6, 6.30ish on the evening of the 27th and the van actually ended up being an exact match. They talked to authorities and then uploaded the video and it didn't take long for it to be passed all around the internet. And while people were looking at it, someone noticed a sandal in the back of the van, just one that looked like Gabby's. Also, when the footage is slowed down, a lot of people have speculated about a strange figure out in the field to the left of the van. And this person appears to be bending over, leading to speculation that maybe this was Brian burying something in the field. Now, of course, this is completely speculative. We have no idea if that is even a human, but I definitely wanted to mention it. And what's also weird is when you look at the footage at first, when they start approaching the van, the back of the van, the doors are open, but as they get closer, the doors close. We're not completely sure at this point, but it seems like this footage led authorities to Gabby's remains. And on September 19th, they announced that remains had been found. Within hours, the Denver FBI announced they would be 
holding a press conference to discuss the remains that were found. I actually was just boarding a flight, so I ended up paying for the Wi-Fi, which I never do, so that I could watch the press conference. And it was then announced that the remains were likely Gabby Petito. This is an incredibly difficult time for the family and friends. Our thoughts and prayers are with them. We ask that you all respect the privacy as they mourn the loss of their daughter. As you are aware, FBI personnel, in coordination with our partners at National Park Service, the Forest Service, Teton County Sheriff's Office, and Jackson Police Department, have been conducting an investigative activity in the vicinity of the Spread Creek um, dispersed camping area. Earlier today, human remains were discovered, consistent with the description of Gabrielle Gabby Petito. Full forensic identification has not been completed to confirm 100% that we found Gabby, but her family has been notified of this discovery. The cause of death has not been determined at this time. We appreciate your continued support and patience as we work through this process. When this news broke, a lot of people were very angry with authorities, wondering how Brian possibly could have gotten away. Law enforcement said that without a body, without evidence, that they have no reason to believe that he's a suspect. They said they simply just did not have enough evidence to justify monitoring his house 24 seven. And at this point, there was still no information about her cause of death or the condition of her body. So there was all types of speculation going around you know, was this a homicide or did she die from natural elements? Which was definitely the lesser believed theory. But now that they had a body and they believed it was Gabby's, police had cause for a search warrant of the laundry house. So on Monday, September 20th, law enforcement swarmed their home, which has now been called a crime scene. We don't know what they were hoping to find, but we know that this was an extensive search. 25 FBI agents, many of them in tactical gear when they went inside the home. We know they searched the camper right here. They searched inside the house. They were in the back in a shed, really not leaving any stone unturned, but still right now, no sign of Gabby's fiance Brian Laundry. Roberta and Christopher Laundry were escorted by FBI agents into an unmarked vehicle to wait for the search to be completed and the warrant authorized authorities to seize computers other electronic devices as well as photographs and they've taken tons of evidence out. They also seized the silver Ford Mustang that is believed to have been the way that Brian got to the Carlton Reserve. It's all very confusing how the car got back to the home. There's a lot of questions right now and none of it's been verified by the police. But it's believed that the police found the car originally abandoned on September 14th at the Carlton Reserve. Some officer rolled up on Brian's car, ticketed it, left a note saying that if it wasn't moved, it would be towed and they never ran the plates. Brian's parents said when he didn't come back from the Carlton Reserve, they got worried. So they went out to look for him and that's when they found his car, but they decided to leave it there in case he came back. They claim that they went back on Thursday, got the vehicle and brought it back to their house. I'm not sure about this. It's still unverified and people are very confused. The search warrant on the laundry home has revealed a little bit more information about the case, including some text messages between Gabby and her mom that proved how much she and Brian were at odds with each other during this trip. And there was also an incredibly strange text sent to Gabby's mom on August 27th from Gabby. It said, can you help Stan? I just keep getting his voicemails and missed calls. Now Stan is Gabby's grandfather but Gabby never referred to him as Stan. She always called him grandpa, and her mom knew immediately that something was wrong when that text came in. Then yesterday, September 20th, a 911 call was released from a witness who had seen Gabby and Brian's fight outside of the co-op. Uh, we drove by and the gentleman was slapping the girl. And then we stopped, they ran up and down the sidewalk, he proceeded to hit her, hopped in the car, and they drove off. So today when I'm recording, the attorney for the family was supposed to do a press conference out of New York at 1 p.m. Eastern. However, he canceled it the day before because he said he had talked to the FBI, but he has denied that the FBI made him cancel it. He said he did it in the client's best interest. So right before I started recording this, it was announced that the remains found are officially 
Gabby Petito's, but we also found out that they believe it was a homicide, which changes everything. A full autopsy was started today as well by the Teton County Coroner, Dr. Brent Blue. The cause of death has not been released. All they've said is they are confident it was a homicide. I'm not sure how long the autopsy results will take to come back. It can take weeks, sometimes even longer. The toxicology report will probably take even longer than the autopsy report. The FBI announced that a forensic search of the area where Gabby was found was also completed on Tuesday. And right now the search for Brian is still active. No one knows where Brian is. He has been seen several times in Mobile, Alabama. However, they don't believe he is there. Authorities seem to believe he is still in Florida, but no one knows. They searched the Carlton Reserve all day today, and they just posted that they are planning to spend tomorrow searching it as well. So they must have reason to believe he could still be in there. As of right now, like I've said, Brian is still a person of interest in the case only. He is not considered a suspect. So the FBI is still asking the public for help with this case. They obviously need any tips about where Brian might be or any information about him in general that could help. But they also say they need more information about the days leading up to Gabby's death so that they can build a criminal case. So again, anyone who is in the Spread Creek dispersed camping area between August 27th and August 30th, who may have had contact with Gabby or Brian, or may have even seen their van, are asked to call 1-800-CALL-FBI. And if you have any photos, they can be uploaded at fbi.gov slash petito. If you have been touched by this case and you wanna help their family, maybe by making a donation, again, make sure that you only donate to one of two places that the family has approved. You can donate directly to their GoFundMe or through the John F. McNamara Foundation. Those are the only two legitimate fundraisers anything else is fake. Their family plans to use the donations for legal costs, transportation fees, and just to support family members through this time. They plan on donating any remaining funds to a charity of their choice in honor of Gabby. So again, I will be making a donation to them. You know, hopefully this video will be monetized so I can do quite a bit more, but whether it's, you know, monetized or not, I'll definitely be making a donation because this case had just broken my heart. Seeing Gabby in those clips, you know, the body cam footage, seeing how upset, how distressed, how scared she was is incredibly upsetting, especially when you compare it to her normal, smiling, happy, beautiful self that she would post in her other content. I think with these cases, it's just really hard not to put yourself in the victim's shoes or in the family's shoes and imagine how devastating this would be. Like, how do you even begin to move on? How do you go from here? And it's gonna be years ahead for them trying to get justice. You know, this battle is only starting. That is all I know about this case as of the time that it is being uploaded. If there is anything new, I will pin it as a comment. I will also be covering this on my next podcast episode, Mile Higher, that will be linked below. That will be coming out next week and hopefully there is more information by then, new updates to go over. Also, I might do some live streaming for this case as updates and new information continues to come out. But that is gonna be it for me today, guys. I wish I had more to share with you, but that is all we know right now. I hope you guys all stay safe out there. Have a good one and I will see you soon. Thank you.